today when it's all disappeared, I think most visitors are still quite taken aback by the fact that you can stand on what was part of the track bed of the railway and try and gauge the fact that, you know, there was a full-sized railway line running through the grounds. Um, The Victorians, um, in reaching their solutions to problems like um, burial congestion, sewerage and so on, they used the best that technology could offer them in a way to, to, to resolve and solve that solution. Um, and the idea had been suggested by a guy called um, um, John Claudius Loudon, who was a, effectively a garden landscape gardener. And he'd actually suggested this in the 1840s. And he had suggested this area as one where um, a cemetery could be laid out and served by rail to London. Brookwood now contains about 235,000 burials. The cemetery is still privately owned and administered, and a recent Home Office report suggests it has the potential to become a World Heritage Site. Churchill once wrote, the history of um, mankind is the history of war, and that is reflected at Brookwood because the first private grave in the cemetery grounds was of a soldier. And we sadly have to remember that the military cemetery is one of the only, if not the only, military cemetery in the UK where military burials still take place. And the cemetery is burying some of the casualties from Afghanistan. Um, But the military cemeteries that we know today um, started in 1917, nearly at the end of the First World War, and they were primarily designed for the burial of servicemen and women who died in hospitals, military hospitals in the London military district. After the First World War, um, there were further developments with the American military cemetery, which was completed in 1929. And the Second World War also saw the development of national um, parts, such as the um, burial areas for the Free French forces, um, the Czechoslovakians, the Poles and the Belgians, to name but a few, and also a section reserved for the Turkish Air Force. The Necropolis Company um, used gardeners, um, some of whom had trained at Kew, and they seemed to home in on initially um, American varieties of um, planting and particularly noteworthy are the giant sequoia, uh, the redwoods, which were planted um, originally in avenues along some of the principal routes through the cemetery. And the major one was the cemetery railway, which still, the route of that still maintains um, its avenue of sequoias, which links the two sides of the cemetery together. This is my favourite time of year. When it starts coming together, when summer starts approaching, flowers are in bloom, it's um, the birds, the birds are singing, it's special. It's somewhere else. You know, um, that's my favourite time of year. Uh, the deer come up to the lake. You can see them early in the morning drinking the water. The rabbits are bouncing about all over the place. But it, it comes alive when you see the natural um, elevation of, of life, if you like. This statue here is very personal to me. Um, and I think it's, it's self-explanatory. If you know... Um, what that trying to say is, you know, he's grieving, he's lost his, his wife, his loved one. That says everything for me. Walking round, classically, trying to cut back some roadies, I've come across this big stone which represented the reinterment of the Great Fire of London. And I'm standing there and I'm thinking, this is real. It's hit me, you know, this is like 35 years later. Wow. But the place had been left for many, many years. 
um, it had been used as a dumping ground. Um, and, you know, nobody cared. So the old man, in his own way, uh, started restoring. He gave me a bow saw. He said, start sawing. So for the first five years, we were cutting and cleaning. And every time we took a bush down, it was a memorial, a stone. It was somebody. The history of that person. Um, you know, we we grown to respect the dead. That's our cultural background. Um, and regardless of who or what, you've got to respect the dead. You know, that that's the unspoken word. It doesn't need to be said. So uh, with that in mind, that's what we've done. We've got so much history here. It's just, you know, important to keep that. You know, we learn from our history. So for me, who I wasn't very good at history, I've got to be honest with you, I've ended up with uh, the biggest history classroom in the world. So everyone here has a history which has probably had an input or an effect on the way that we've grown up. They're here. So, you know, to, to ignore it is very ignorant. Well, this church was built in 1908, and the one next to it was the first cemetery chapel. That was built, I think, in 1852. And the one behind that is where we live, and that was only completed four years ago, four years this coming September, and that's, in fact, our monastic dwelling. The relics of St. Edward were given to us on condition we had a church to put them in, and so we had to obtain a church. And it so happened that this building, the one next to it, were up for sale at the time. St. Edward from Mars is important to us because he was one of the ancient... English kings from before the schism. The schism between the East and the West occurred in 1055. Um, St. Edward, in fact, was one of the last of the ancient Anglo-Saxon kings, and he was killed when he was quite young. I think he was about 16, so he was very young. And um, the reason he was killed was that um, he was a very pious young man, and his stepmother was very jealous that her son would become king. And when St. Edward was crowned, she realised probably that she didn't have too long to do this because um, he was crowned um, and then Lent occurred, and um, during Lent there's no time for marriages, but after Lent uh, you can marry. And so she realised that after Lent St Edward probably would marry and have children, so she wanted him murdered during Lent before he could have a chance to marry. And so she invited him to Corf, um, which is in Dorset, South Dorset, and um, the castle didn't exist then, it was a manor house made of wood, and she invited him to drink and she gave him a goblet of wine, and then while um, St Edward was drinking, um, a retainer stood behind him and stabbed him. And the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle says that no worse crime had been committed uh, in English history till then. And uh, the reason for that is that St Edward, of course, was the anointed crowned monarch. And also he was murdered um, when he was being given hospitality, which was a sacred thing to the Anglo-Saxons, that no one ever um, murdered or attacked someone when they were given hospitality, and especially by his own stepmother. So it was seen as a particularly um, nasty and um, unpleasant crime. There's the beauty of the cemetery and also there's the quiet, there's the animals here, there's deer, there's foxes, rabbits. Um, and I suppose in a way it's an oasis because outside it's so noisy and so much turmoil. When you come here it's very really quiet and it's a little world away. Brookwood Cemetery represents the whole world, every religion, every culture. And you should be honoured to be in a position where you're preparing the last resting place. Uh, people come to us with their loved ones and they, it's unconditional trust. They expect, you know, you treat their loved one with the greatest dignity and everything else. So I tell my guys, this is who and what you are. Uh, I'm privileged and honoured to be in such a unique position. So I've got to rise to the challenge. And that means protecting it, restoring the cemetery, teaching people to respect the place, you know, it should be loved. It's, you know, you've got to understand when you're looking at that stone, who that name is, what that name is, what influence, and what, what you know, what effect has it had? Because everyone here, one way or another, has left an influence behind.